well. <laughs> well, you can turn to Matthew four, chap or chapter four, if you would, please. Is it safe? Okay. That's a line from an old movie. Long time ago. Is it safe? Dustin Hoffman. Never mind. So I um, apologize for being late this morning. I'm not used to being up this high. <laughs> but um, so, uh, yeah, the weather wreaked havoc. I'm about ready to leave, and there was a car in my front yard that was uninvited. And instead of letting me pull them out, they just decided to try to make their way across the ditch. It took a few times, but uh, anyway, uh, good to be with you this morning, and I'm glad you're here and you made it through all of the, all of the weather. So, why don't we read Matthew chapter four, verses one through 11 together, and see what God has to say to us this morning. Scripture says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward he was hungry. And now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall, live, or shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we are grateful for your word to us. We thank you for it. We thank you for coming to us, seeking us out and saving us. We thank you that you did that by providing a perfect, holy sacrifice, Jesus, who lived a perfect, sinless life. There could be no other sacrifice other than Him. We thank You for that. And by doing that, You have secured our salvation. We can have confidence now because what you have provided is enough, and that's Jesus. Help us, God, to hold on to that truth today. And thank you for holding on to us. In Jesus' name, amen. In the Garden of Eden... Oh, there we go. In the Garden of Eden, the serpent came to Eve and said... Uh, and questioned God and asked this question, said, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And then the serpent tested Eve again and denied God and said, You shall not die. And then the serpent tested Eve again and said, and called God a liar and said, You will not surely die. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. 
what followed in verse 6 of chapter uh, of Genesis chapter 3 is a short detailed account of the nature of sin and how it all worked out of what temptation really is at its core and in Genesis chapter 3 in verse 6 it simply says these words so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. She saw that it was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was desirable to make one wise. In that verse, in that one incident of sin, we really have three different ways that Adam and Eve had failed. She saw that it was good for food, that was the lust of the flesh. She saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. That was the lust of the eyes. And she reasoned that it was desirable to make one wise. That was the, the pride of life. And at one incident, she and Adam experienced all of the different facets of sin that there are. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And John, in his first letter, he warned his Christian children against loving the world and said this, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. That's in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. Every sin falls into one of those categories, and we somehow, oftentimes, we make it a lot more complicated than it really is. But it's one of those. Sin is simple in its meaning. It's a denial of God and His will in my thoughts and my actions. It's quite simple. It always happens in one of those three forms. The passionate desire of what we see or imagine, the lust of the eyes. That's the sin of having. The passionate desire of what we feel in the body. The lust of the flesh. That's the sin of doing. And then the arrogant display of being something more. The pride of life. That's the sin of being. Our sins, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life are all about having and doing and being. That's really where they all fall down. Jesus Christ came into this world for the sole purpose of proclaiming and providing liberty to each one of us who was enslaved in sin. And He not only told us about it, He secured it for us. And He went to the cross and He was raised up from the dead so that He could provide it for us. But to settle the question as to whether or not Jesus was worthy for such a task, and remember, He was a man, He was a human, he was born into this world in exactly the same way as everyone else. He was just conceived supernaturally. The question of his righteousness, his worthiness to be the Savior of the world had to be answered. And so, witness was given to that fact. And so as Jesus was revealed in the world in this very public way, John the Baptist declared that Jesus was worthy to secure our salvation. He said, Behold, uh, the Lamb of God. In verse 11 of Matthew chapter 3, he said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. John gave testimony that Jesus was worthy to be the Savior of the world. Then the Father, at his baptism, proclaimed the same thing. He proclaimed his approval of Jesus to the whole world, and he did so when John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus. The Spirit of God descended on Jesus, and the Father spoke from above and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So John testified of his worthiness. The Father testified of his worthiness to be the Savior of the world. 
but so that everyone would know that Jesus was worthy. Not just by the testimony of John, not just by the testimony of the Father. Jesus had to be proven himself. He had to be tested, and more accurately, to be tempted. He had to be shown adequate for the work to which the Father had called him. And that is the account that we read in Matthew chapter 4. John had testified. The Father had testified. But now it was time to see whether or not those words were really true. And so Jesus faced temptation. After Jesus was baptized, Matthew tells us that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Mark tells us that it was, his name was Satan. Some of you may question the leadership of God in all of this, and I understand that because it can be a little bit confusing. But it's important to remember that it is the devil who actually does the tempting, not the Spirit and not the Father. And second of all, it is Satan <coughs> has, actually has no power to tempt anyone independent of God and his permission. I would reference you to Job. He had to ask permission before he was allowed to do that. So here, God allowed Satan to try to disqualify the Son of God by showing him to be a sinner. That was his goal. That was Satan's goal. Satan hates God. He has ever since he was cast out of heaven, and so he hates all that belong to the Father. And so God permitted this temptation of Jesus because you and I and the rest of humanity needed to know that Jesus was actually qualified to be the Savior of the world, the perfect Redeemer, the perfect sacrifice that would satisfy all of the demands of God. And the only way that that would happen would be if he were to be tested and to be proven to be faithful. And so I want us to look this morning at, oh, they're already up there. Uh, the first point there, when tested by doing, Jesus lived on the Father's word. Now we can take this account of, of Jesus, this incident of Jesus here, and this story, and we can take it and just sort of apply it to ourselves and we can say, well, this is how I ought to respond to temptation. This is how I ought to respond when Satan comes to me. And that's okay. We can do that. That's legitimate. But the point of this passage of Scripture, I believe, is to let everyone know that Jesus is sinless. That when it comes to being qualified to be that perfect Lamb of God that we read about in the Old Testament that would be the atonement for your sins and mine Jesus was sinless he was perfect and so as we look at each of these temptations this morning I want you to look to that end and if you're having a question about whether or not you can believe in Jesus, I want to encourage you in something. I, used to, I struggled with my faith for a long time, for many years. And I'll spare you the story, but just to, just to, just to get to the end of it and say to you this. I thought for so long that it depended on how intense I believed that determined whether or not I would be saved. And that was wrong. Because in the scripture I read about great faith and you read about these people that, that believed so intently and people would stand and give their testimonies as I was a teenager, as I went to church and I would hear about their faith and how they trusted God. And what I realized in my own heart was I didn't have that kind of faith. Until one day, and you might say, well, you're kind of you're thick in the head because we knew this all along. But one day I was reading in the scripture 
and the Lord had, had taken all of these scriptures and pulled them together and convinced me of the fact that it is the validity of Jesus Christ that determines your salvation, not how much faith you have. Just the faith, the tiniest bit of faith, like the size of a mustard seed, if it's placed in the right place, will yield much. And I stopped focusing on what, how hard I was believing and how intently I was believing. And I started focusing on the satisfactory Savior and how sufficient He was. And all of a sudden, salvation became very clear to me. This is all about Jesus. This isn't about me. And that's proven here in this passage. So when it, Jesus was tested by doing, he lived on the Father's word. In verses 1 through 4 again, I want you to see what the response is. What Jesus said, he says, he answered in verse 4, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus was in the wilderness. We don't know exactly where that is. But if you look at some of the descriptions around the Jordan River, uh, between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, probably the wilderness was somewhere near the Jordan because he had just not long before been baptized there. And one man who's traveled there, and some of you may have as well, through it assures us that it is a miserable and horrid place. It consisted of high, barren mountains so that it looks as if nature had suffered some sort of a violent convulsion there. Another man said, It was a vast, undulating expanse of barren, chalky soil covered with broken stones and rocks and a bit of brushwood with snakes crawling underneath it. This is where Jesus was sent to be tempted. He was led by the Spirit into this wilderness to be tempted, and it was there that he fasted. It was a complete fast. He didn't fast just like sometimes people do today where they just don't eat all day and then they eat after a certain time of the day. Jesus fasted all day, 24 hours a day, for 40 days. And then the scripture says, and he was hungry. I guess so. We have the term hangry to describe us when we don't eat for a day. Jesus did not eat for 40 of those. And it was near the end that the accuser, Satan, came to him and tested him first by tempting him to do a miracle for himself. Take this stone and change it into bread and everything will be good. It was physical. It was the sin of doing, or the temptation of doing. Now, I've never fasted for 40 days. I've heard of some that have attempted it. Some have completed it. It may have been one of you. I don't know. I have a question. Why would that have been a sin for Jesus to have taken that stone and turned it into bread to satisfy his hunger? Eating is not a sin. Or is it? In that moment, for that time period, God was proving the Son to be the Son. And so Jesus was in this refining fire, the kind that makes pure gold. For Jesus to have yielded to the hunger and used his supernatural powers to convert a stone into bread would have been to deny the Father's timing and the Father's provision for his life. And it would have been denying the Father to put Jesus through this test and to prove his sinlessness. He would have lost, and then you and I would have lost. It is not a sin to eat unless God says, don't eat. When John announced that Jesus uh, of Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that declaration was not by accident. The Lamb, the perfect, unblemished sacrifice that we read about in the Old Testament that was prefigured back then was now in the flesh standing in front of John. 
And that sacrifice had to be proven the same way that they would take that lamb before they would sacrifice it in the Old Testament. They would examine it and they would look for blemishes or defects, birth defects, or something that they had, uh, that, the, that the animal had been uh, injured by, uh, an eye uh, in the mouth, the hoofs, the, the, the legs, anything. That's what was going on here was Jesus was being examined in this temptation to see if he was satisfactory to be the sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Paul told the Corinthians, he said, For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And so the question for Jesus was this, will I allow God to provide for me when he is ready, or will I take the easy way out, the expedient way, the way that causes me the least frustration, the least distress, the least pain, the way that gets to the desire as fast as possible with re without regards to the means? Will I use my own powers for my own self-interest? That was the question. That was the temptation that he was facing. He, Jesus was not opposed to eating. He turned water into wine. He turned the loaves and the fish into a banquet twice. He filled the nets with 153 fish Nets that were empty all night. And then in the morning, he fills them up. Jesus was not opposed to food and to eating. Eating is not a sin. But again, I say, when God says don't, it is a sin. The temptation of the flesh is strong. And this is the most basic of human needs. Food is, I guess, it would be next to, next to sleep itself. Most basic of human needs would be to eat. And God said don't. And don't for a long time. Because you need to be tested. We have a wonderful, perfect, sinless Savior. Jesus did not sin. And how did he respond? He responded by appealing to the Old Testament Scriptures. And he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the, from the mouth of God. You know, back in Deuteronomy, where Jesus quotes that, uh, goes to quote that, uh, that was a, there was a recounting there uh, by Moses of the history of Israel. And he wanted the children of Israel to know in the wilderness, as he gave them manna from heaven, he allowed them for a time to go hungry for a bit. They began to, to cry out. Now, it wasn't for 40 days, but they began to cry out. And the scripture tells us that that's the reason that God did that was because he wanted them to know that he was the one that was feeding them. And it's ironic here that Jesus, who is the bread himself that came down from heaven, he is the manna from heaven, was now hungry. He wanted them to know that life the definition of life was much more than just the physical. It's not about food. It's not about drink. It's about feeding upon the Word of God. About depending upon God to meet the need. That's life. That's life. And Jesus said, I will not. I will depend upon God and God alone. The Israelites had failed. Adam and Eve had failed. But Jesus would not fail. He knew that life was more than food. Just a couple of observations about this incident. Jesus' sinless nature is being tested by physical means. That can happen to us, by the way. In a number of different ways. Some of you have been through struggles physically. And you realize that as you're going through them, 
that it is really a spiritual battle that you're dealing with. It's not a physical one. You're being tested as to whether or not you will trust God. Jesus pulled back the physical so that we could see the, the, the purity in Christ. The flesh was overruled by the Spirit. And I wonder how often do you and I allow the physical, the lust of the flesh to determine our actions. The sin that so easily harasses us, as the writer of Hebrews said, it's oftentimes the lust of the flesh. But a second observation here is, do you realize that Jesus here actually redefines what life is in saying this? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. I would think that some in our government might like to read that and understand that and come to that understanding that life is not defined by the scientists and the beginning of it. God is the one that determines what life is. And he says, I can sustain life simply by the word of God. And he did so in Jesus' life. The test of starvation was to show that Jesus was at his, what he was at his inmost being and that life is found in God and that the sustaining and creating power of God is found in his word. I have forgotten that too many times. Sometimes I have acted like an animal in my own life. I have let the lust of the flesh, and that comes in so many different forms, control. Jesus never did. Some people ask the question uh, as they're sitting in their classrooms and question this, uh, th this matter of theology. Was Jesus able not to sin or was he not able to sin? And that debate will go back and forth. Could Jesus have sinned? Theoretically, could he have? The answer in the scripture is that he did not. And that's the answer that we need to know. Jesus never sinned. If you're questioning whether or not you can trust the Savior, don't look at what you've done. You need to trust the Savior. You're not worthy. So save the discussion. None of us are. Jesus is worthy. Throw yourself at Jesus' mercy because He is worthy. Because He is the sacrifice that God the Father has accepted. And you will be saved. Jesus was worthy because he relied on the word of God alone for his life. Second, when the test of being came, Jesus waited on the Father's way. In verses 5 through 7, we see that the devil took him up to the, uh, into the holy temple and he set him up on this pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. And then he quotes the Old Testament. And he says, uh, or Satan does, he says, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now this was the pinnacle of the temple, would have been on the southeast side, and it would have been this, this flat top on top of Solomon's porch that overlooked the Kidron Valley, and just on the other side of that would have been the Garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus would have been able to look over that valley, Look over across the Kidron Valley, which is where uh, back in the Old Testament they used to take, and, and every time uh, a good king would come in and, and, and purify the land, they would take all the idols and they would take the trash and they would throw it down in that Kidron, Kidron Valley. And across that would have been the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus spent so much time praying. And he would have been able to see that. And he's standing there and looking at it. And Satan says throw yourself down from here and God's going to protect you and he quotes scripture but he doesn't quote all of it because he leaves some of it out and the idea being here that if Jesus had wanted to Jesus would have gained a following by his throwing himself down and floating down to the bottom of the ground and people would have followed him like that but that's not what God had 
as a design for him. He would have had instantaneous fame. People would have flocked to him. They would have followed every word of Jesus. Again, the thing that Jesus was there to do would have come the wrong way. To satisfy his hunger, Jesus could have turned that stone into bread and he could have eaten. But that's not what God had in mind. God said, I want you to live by my word, and Jesus knew that. In this way, Jesus could have thrown himself down. He could have uh, become an instantaneous success in the eyes of all the people, and people would have followed him. Now, ultimately, that's what would happen. Would, the, would, would much of the world would follow Jesus, but that is not the way that it would happen. And Jesus knew that it was not God's way. He would have had people believe in him, but not according to God's will. Jesus came to die for the sins of the world and be raised up from the dead. And people would believe in him by faith and they would trust him and that's how they would follow him. Not because he did some trick, but because he paid the eternal price for their sins. Jesus would not, would not sin by taking the easy way out. He wouldn't do it. By avoiding the cross. By gaining followers by some sort of a carny trick. He wouldn't do it. He went to the cross. He died. He paid the price for the sins of the world. And then he was raised from the dead. His test of being of what he was to be to the world would not be arrived at by unscrupulous means. What gives you meaning in life? And what are you prepared to avoid to get it? What gives you purpose? See, sometimes we take the easy way out. It's easy on the job to be tempted to not do things God's way, to take a different means to success. And I'm digressing here just a bit in applying this to us personally. But when we look at these sins, we realize, or these temptations, we realize that every single one of us has failed in every single one of them. Multiple times. But Jesus never did. Jesus succeeded in all of them. He resisted all of them. That's why we can believe in Him. We tempt and we test God when we put ourselves in harm's way and we assume that God's going to bail us out. That's what they did in the book of Exodus. And that's why they, what they did in Deuteronomy. What are you assuming about God in the way that you live every day? What are you assuming about Him? God is so patient with us. We fail over and over and over again. And God is so patient. But he could be so because of Jesus. Jesus is worthy because he waited on the Father's method of achieving redemption. And then finally, when the test of having came, Jesus worshipped only the Father. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, it says again, the devil took him up on that exceedingly high mountain. He showed him the kingdoms of the world. Verse 9, he said, all these I'll give you. I'll give it all to you. Jesus said, away with you, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Why was that sin? I mean... The scripture tells us, Paul told us, that all things were created by him and for him. All things for Jesus Christ. I mean, all of the kingdoms of the world were his. Why would it have been sin to go ahead and just take them? Well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they weren't Satan's to give. But I won't debate that too much because it does say that, that, that Satan has some authority in this world. He does. And I think Satan probably could have given him some things temporarily. But Jesus would have been destroyed in the process. The truth of the matter is, is Jesus was the creator of all of those things that the devil was showing him. All of those things were created by him and for him. 
And yet Jesus in His humanity, under this temptation that God had, by the, by the Spirit, had led Him into, and Satan is tempting Him here, in the flesh, in this body He's living, to be tested, it would have destroyed Jesus. He would have been disqualified. He would have sinned in bowing the knee to Satan in worshiping him. And Jesus responded and said, there's only one to worship, and that is God. No other gods before me. Worship him and him alone. What are you trying to get in your life apart from God? Have you compartmentalized God? And Sunday's the day, or some other part of the week is the day, but then when you go to work, there's this, there's this wall that says, I'm going to live a, a different way. What, what are you doing to gain what God really wants to give you, but He wants to give it to you His way? Jesus is worthy because of his allegiance and absolute trust of the Father as he guided him in every step. He could have avoided the cross, theoretically. Jesus could have done that. He could have taken the easy way out. But then you and I wouldn't have a Savior today. We wouldn't have one. Hebrews chapter 9 it says this excuse me chapter 10 it says therefore when he came into the world he said sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O oh God. Are you questioning today whether or not you've got enough faith to believe? I would say the answer to that question is... Stop looking at your faith and start looking at the Savior. Look at the Savior. He never sinned when He came to having. He never sinned when it came to doing. He never sinned when it came to His purpose of being. He never sinned. He followed God all the way. Most of you, if you're married, you probably have one of these on your finger. Gold ring. I think my son switched. To, when he got married, he went to a different metal. I don't know why he did that, but he did that. But you know, this gold is almost pure, but it's not. Because when I got married, I couldn't afford the really pure stuff. But you know how they get it pure? They heat it up, they melt it, and all the junk that's in that metal floats up to the top. They call it slag or dross. And when you cool it off, you take that cooled off metal, and it's now hard, and you smack it with a hammer, and all that stuff just falls away. And sometimes they have to do that process of heating and cooling and heating and cooling again and again and again. But in the end, what you end up with is pure gold. Jesus was heated up again and again and again in temptation. And it wasn't just here, by the way, it was throughout his life. It was when he was on the cross. Do you know what came to the top 
You know what kind of stuff came to the top? Nothing. Nothing. The point of the temptation was not to make Jesus pure. The point was to prove that he is. And if you're struggling with your salvation today, I beg you, if you're struggling with this idea of, of coming to Christ, I beg you, throw yourself at the mercy of the one who has always been and who always will be perfectly pure and sinless because he has made the ultimate sacrifice for your sins. Throw yourself at his mercy and believe on him. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your testimony to us of who Jesus is. You told us that he was coming. He came. You've also told us that he's coming again. God, I pray today that you give the freedom in the hearts of everyone in this room to trust Jesus and Jesus alone for their salvation. Because he's enough. And he's all there is. In his name we pray. Amen.